This is a continuation of an analysis of the ruin of Kush by Roberto Colasso, which is a very deep and incisive taking apart an analysis of the incoming of modernity, commencing with the age of revolution, and in particular the French Revolution. So I'm just going to discuss one or two paragraphs that he has written. Again, looking at his observations of modernity. So at the beginning of the book, it is set in the time of revolution with the changing of eras from the age of monarchy to the age of republic. And he focuses on a particular personality called Talleyrand, who is a bishop who manages to straddle or transfer himself from one age to the next in a kind of invisible manner. And so we are looking at some of Talleyrand's observations of the era. So on page 28, Colasso writes, but through the eyes of Talleyrand, Things no longer have a fixed weight. They fluctuate, immense, vaporous, poisonous bodies. They do not rest in themselves. Nothing stands firm. There is nothing less corporeal and more empty than the will. Nor is it possible to find an immediately visible bond between that silent emptiness, pure compressed energy, and the rampant transformations that it provokes, often without granting any truce before the devastation. And writers on modernity, such as Marshall Berman, uh, who's written a kind of Marxist text on modernity, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, these Historians of modernity often say that one of its characteristics is this fluctuating, uh, unstable nature. So as Colasso writes, things no longer have a fixed weight. Everything is set into motion. And that motion, while it seems to have a purpose ultimately becomes just a motion in itself. It becomes a constant current of disruption of cultures, of families, relationships, philosophies, religions. It becomes a consistently destabilizing force that in the beginning, looks like it's going to achieve something at the end, but actually which just continues to disrupt without anything in particular settling into place, without there being a clear path on which to embark. So Colasso writes that things no longer have a fixed weight. They fluctuate. Immense, vaporous, poisonous bodies In a sense, this is summing up the forces of our modern age. We can think of the giant corporations that govern our governments these days. These are kind of invisible bodies that are not easily available or accessible, uh, but which have such an influence over how we live our lives. And then Colasso says about the things of this modern age, they do not rest in themselves. So everything is set in flux and nothing is settled or certain. Nothing stands firm, as he says. Then he says there is nothing less corporeal and more empty than the will. And this is quite interesting because... We see that at the time that uh, Friedrich Nietzsche was writing, he was talking about will to power, uh, 
and this was an age where it was considered that the will of the people is something almost divine, something sacred, something infallible, and that governorship of nations must go to the will of the people, and that if we will something to happen, then it surely will happen. If we will our cultures to change, to improve, if we will to overthrow the old order, then that will in itself is something that is surely going to attain its ends. So Colasso makes an interesting observation here, that nothing is more empty than the will, because will in itself, in a sense, is not rooted in something more primordial or in something that is more uh, spiritual, that has some kind of um, divine root or that has some even some kind of philosophical root. The will in itself is not something that is sacred and infallible. It can actually be applied in quite a meaningless manner to forces in society, to economies, to politics. And so here Calasso is saying that it actually has no meaning in itself. To will things to change, to believe in the will of the people for certain bodies or entities or groups to press their will for changes does not actually provide society with any deeper meaning or any deeper understanding of itself and of its destiny. So then he says, nor is it possible to find an immediately visible bond between that silent emptiness, pure compressed energy. So he's talking about the energy of revolution and the rampant transformations that it provokes. So he's saying that, okay, you know, the people are willing for change and they are pressing for change. And they are concentrating all that energy towards this change. And we can all relate to that as, as youth, as young people. We have this intense energy and desire to transform our societies, uh, to fight for something better. But he's saying that the transformations that arise out of these movements, out of this will are not necessarily the direct result of those movements and of that will. There is no direct correlation. It's almost accidental what happens as a result of the bringing together of this will. And so he says, often without granting any truce before the devastation. So he's actually saying that these revolutionary movements, if they start to exalt the will of whoever is leading that revolution, if they are started to be starting to be carried along by that will, then transformations and devastations can result in a kind of headlong tidal wave uh, without any composition without any steadiness without any consideration of a truce with which that against this will is fighting and then on page 30 he is talking about the intoxication of taking part in this kind of movement 
So he says the intoxication of taking part in forward movement, as if a wave were not of the sea's making, but a result of one's own will, was long considered a generous illusion. But in the end, it nauseated, it nauseated lucid minds, such as Baudelaire and Flaubert after 1848. Viewed from a distance of almost two centuries after that grand beginning, this illusion now merits nothing but contempt. Yet it still nourishes the good conscience of the intelligentsia of the West, a West that binds the world like adhesive tape. One continually dreams of going to the people, in inverted commas, and finally shuts oneself up with them in a torture chamber. So, just to go over this paragraph that he writes, of course, again, we, we can understand that movements that are taken up by the people that provide a forward movement um, can be intoxicating to bring about change, significant change in one's society is intoxicating. And he's saying that actually this movement is something that pertains to all movements, that there is a kind of mathematical or scientific calculation that means that if a certain number of people get together and they join their wills together for a particular aim and they take certain actions for bringing about this aim, then what is uh, going to arise is this movement that seems to have been brought about by the will of the people. But actually, it's just a kind of domino effect. It's, it's just a kind of inevitable outcome of people creating disruption or people fighting to overthrow something or people striving to implement their ideals. And he's saying that actually this, this idea that it is um, a result of one's will has, again, for, for many centuries been considered a generous illusion, i.e. people started to see through it. So with this revolutionary age, end of the 18th century into the 19th century in Europe and elsewhere, later on, people could see that the changes and transformations and devastation that resulted from this movement were not actually all down to the will of the people, but actually were just the result of forces unleashed in an uncontrollable manner that then have a knock-on effect with other forces. And so, as he says, viewed from a distance of almost two centuries after that grand beginning, this illusion now merits nothing but contempt. So he is saying that when one is carried away in a particular movement and intoxicated by this particular movement, one cannot see one's own fallibility and one's own littleness in the grand scheme of things. And, as he says, yet it still nourishes the good conscience of the intelligentsia of the West. So there is still this idea in the West that we can have control over our lives, that we can control our future, that our place in the world is just a matter of controlling it and pressing for what we want through our will. Very interesting that he says, a West that binds the world like adhesive tape. And I would argue that that is a very accurate statement because now wherever we go in the world, 
Southern Hemisphere, Far East, right into Central Siberia, Mongolia, Alaska. One can see the impact of this Western system. Impact made through media, impact made through economies, politics and culture. A system that has been put in place that the world's populations cannot easily escape from. And he says one continually dreams of going to the people and finally shuts himself up with them in a torture chamber. In other words, populism almost necessarily gives rise to torture. Populist movements almost necessarily by default call for the punishment of others and that punishment takes place in the form of arbitrary arrests, imprisonment, torture and disappearances. We can see this also happening in South America. So he says, meanwhile, a new species of man was ceaselessly at work, offering the world a unity that disintegrated everything around it. And Marshall Berman, in his book, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, also says that the kind of unity that modernity offers humanity is something that breaks it apart. I've spoken to people from Poland where they've talked about how the modern economic system and the culture that is also imported with that has disintegrated family ties, has got rid of traditional and classical concepts of chivalry and has encouraged people to advance or increase their desires for greater wealth to take part in this age of modernity, this age of material gain, this age that seems to be so much more advanced than the past. People are chasing after this dream, leaving behind their families, leaving behind human values. And as a result, we are all disintegrating into individual units that don't actually have time for a real human connection. And I'm sure those living in cities will relate to this the most. There just is not the time, there is not the environment to have a deep, genuine human connection where we can attain knowledge of the soul and travel on a journey together. Now everything is rushed and everything is in shorthand and we just hope that codes, if we speak in codes, if we say a few words to each other, that that will be sufficient to convey what we would like to convey on a much more comprehensive and deeper level. So this is my further discussion on this book, The Ruin of Cash by Roberto Calasso. I can recommend everyone to read it. It takes time, but it does give a very good overview of the world in which we are living in the last 200 years that have led up to that. And I will be making more analysis in future. So please keep watching and thank you for listening.